to see this morning, and I'm excited about uh, us being able to participate in this very, very special time this morning. As we begin in believer's baptism, oh, we got a, we got a precious child that we're going to baptize this morning, and she has surrendered her life to the Lord Jesus. And you know, Jesus loves kids, doesn't he? Mark 10, 13, it says, and they were bringing the children to him so that he might touch them. And guess what? The disciples did see it, didn't they? They actually rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, permit the children to come to me and do not hinder them. For such the kingdom of God, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter at all. And he took them in his arms and he began blessing them, laying his hands upon them. Oh, doesn't that make you want to love Jesus even more? Amen. Father, thank you so much for this time this blessed time to be able to participate in today. Father, I thank you for Isabel. I thank you for the fact that she has surrendered her life to you. Thank you for this commitment that she makes, Lord. And I know you're so proud of her. And I pray that you would use her mightily for your kingdom's work and help us, Lord, as a church to always be a support to her. Thank you for her family that loves you pray you'll continue to work in all of them. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, come on. There you go. There you go. Can you see her? trust in Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Amen. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in him, I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. been waiting and ready for this. I'm so excited that God is still in the business of saving, and he's in the business of touching children's lives. And uh, so I ask you today, children, youth, adults, have you invited Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior? Have you repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in him? We don't, have, we don't know how much more time we have to do that. Now's the time. So I encourage you to do that today. And Brother Larry's going to come and lead us. And let's celebrate together. It's a joy to be in God's house today. I'm just going to share this with you this morning. And then I'm going to go get ready and come back out. I saw something this morning. I was talking to our Romanian missionary friend, Brother Eric. The thought was, how dare we complain? How dare we complain about church being too cold or church being too hot? Preacher preaching too long. Music's too loud. Music's too old. It's too new. When we've got believers in the Ukraine today that are worshiping God while bombs are going off. 
and they're hunkered down, but they're worshiping. Maybe that will change a little bit of the way we worship today. I've seen them online worshiping. Maybe you have too. Let's celebrate Jesus today. Amen? Amen. All right. Brother Larry. Good morning. Would you stand with me? We're going to start off with a course that simply says the power of your love. <clears throat>
singing. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let's sing. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power. is your name in all the earth who has set your glory above the heavens 
Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have, you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. Father, we just thank you for our church. Thank you for our church family. And Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, praying for the uh, uh, in the Ukraine, Lord. Father, there's just so much destruction, so many deaths. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you will uh, be involved in that, Lord. And Father, we just thank you for the ones that go in there and Help, trying to help the people, Lord. And Father, we pray for our mission team that's scheduled to go to Romania this, in a few days. And Father, just be with them. Just prepare the way for them. And Father, be the brother of all, Lord, as he leads that team, Lord. Just uh, give him strength. Keep him safe, Lord. And Father, we thank you for money and uh, Mark, Lord, as they've been off in mission, in the mission field, Father. Bring them home safe. And Father, we love you. And Father, we just thank you for your, thank you for your love, your mercy, and your, your goodness, Lord. Your, uh, Father, we just can't say enough. Thank you, Father. Pray in Jesus' name.
Amen. As the choir comes down and the men prepare for the offering, let's sing this chorus. Oh, how he loves you and me. Let's sing together. blessing. I just wish Julie would get just a little energy in that song. <laughs> just a little bit more. Maybe that would be just right. No, praise God. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, choir. Just a wonderful, wonderful time of praise there. Um, after the service today, we're going to be receiving a love offering. Uh, this offering is going to go towards our Camp Hope in Romania, where we will be working at when we go to Romania in just a few days. The, the, um, the, the love offering is going to go to help them with the expenses that they have for the Ukrainian refugees that are staying there. Already there are 36 refugees that are there. Uh, they're looking to go upwards of at least 100, probably, uh, refugees that will be staying there. Um, the camp itself, the mother church there in Romania needs help in being able to take care of their needs and be able to uh, uh, feed them. One of the things that they said that I heard this morning was they said that uh, they had not had a hot meal for two weeks and they were very hungry when they got there and extremely exhausted and all they wanted to do was find somewhere to sleep. Um, so uh, we're going to take this with us when we go. I've invited other churches in our area to participate as well. And so uh, we're going to take up our normal offering at this time. And then I'm going to ask these same guys, if they would, make sure you bring the plates back. And, and we're going to have a plate at every door when you leave. And so you can write a check to the church. Or you can give cash if it's a dollar, ten dollars, whatever you can do will help. And um, then we're going we're gonna to take that money with us uh, when we go. In addition to uh, the church uh, budgets every year, $6,000 to Camp Hope. And, of course, that's usually been used for the construction that we're doing there. But whatever we have to do now is what we're going to do. And so uh, we'll be taking that with us as well. But... Um, Help out as you can, and most of all, pray. Uh, pray for them as they minister to those needs there. So guys, if y'all make sure those plates get back out there, and then we'll do that at the end uh, today. Father, thank you so much for this offering that we received this morning. Uh, thank you for the, those that give. And Lord, I know that you've blessed our church in so many ways financially. And God, we just give you praise for that. And Lord, we want to use the offerings every time they're given in a way that honors you, Lord. And then, Lord, I pray for this special offering that we'll receive today as well, that you would uh, uh, bless those that are being ministered to and bless those that are doing the ministering. In Jesus' name, amen.
I believe that the Lord has gotten a lot of glory in this place today. That's what we want. That's what we desire. From beginning of, of baptism through all the time of, of singing and through that uh, instrumental, thank you so much um, for participating as you have. I want to say something else, too, that I meant to say a while ago about that offering. I want to say about the special offering we're going to receive. I want to say thank you. You've already done so much. You've already given so that we can take these supplies over there, and we're, we're, ta- we're going to take as much as we possibly can. What we can't take, we will ship. Uh, we're going to take as much as what we can um, to be able to get uh, to them. And uh, I just want to thank you again for all that you've done already. Um, and I know it's, it's not an easy time for a lot of us here financially either. Um, we, we know the things that are going on. But I just want to thank you for being faithful. Um, and we know that God's going God's to bless that um, and, and how that you have given. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He said, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. That's not what's on the outline. Well, we're going to get to that in just a second. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says this. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter days some will depart from the faith. They will give heed to deceiving spirits and to doctrines of demons. They will speak lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. We're also told here in verse 13 of 1 Timothy chapter 4, as Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture. That's the That's the role of a pastor. The role of a pastor is to make sure that we're preaching truth, that we're reading the Word of God, and understand that there are those out there that are teaching lies. They are teaching heresy. We know he even describes it as those that have uh, giving heed to deceiving spirits. Obviously, we are inundated today with evil spirits. There is a spiritual war that's going on. This spiritual war is, is what I believe is behind all of the war that we're seeing even now. It is a spiritual battle that's raging 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul tells Timothy, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Convince rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. A man of God is called to preach only the Word of God. There's a lot of philosophies that are being shared in pulpits today. There's a lot of ideology that people have that they're sharing in pulpits today versus the preaching of the Word. We are called upon in our churches to preach the Word of God. Some people, including some immature people, immature believers, go from church to church looking for the right preacher. You notice that before? They go to church to church and they're looking for the right preacher. Unfortunately, many of them are not looking for biblical preaching. In fact, sometimes they get upset when they hear biblical preaching, and so they move on somewhere else. They really don't want biblical exposition 
of Scripture. Paul came to a place that was much like that. Paul came to a place in Corinth, as when we'll continue our study of, of Corinthians, the first Corinthians. He came to Corinth after having a very difficult time. If you study the book of Acts, the book of Acts talks about this journey that he was on. We know that while he was in Philippi, he had been imprisoned. He goes from Philippi to Thessalonica and to Berea, where he's literally going to be kicked out of town. They don't want to hear anything about what he has to say. He moves on to Athens. And he's sharing there, he's amongst all the philosophers of the day, and amongst all of their gods, and he's preaching the truth, and he's mocked. He's laughed at while he's preaching there in Athens. And now he comes to the place where he's coming to Corinth, and Corinth is a pagan city. I gave descriptions a little bit of that a few weeks ago of the kind of place Corinth was, that this was a church that was in a pagan city, and he's deeply anxious. When you read what we're going to read today, you can understand that he was deeply anxious, and his desire was what caused him to have anxiety was that he desired for the gospel of Jesus Christ to take root in this pagan city. And it, for it to take root in this church in Corinth that was having so much trouble. Look at chapter 2, beginning with verse 1 of 1 Corinthians. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. See, they talked about all the different types of preachers that had already been there. They, they were saying, Paul, you, you, you're not the preacher that some of the rest of these guys are. And he says, I've not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined, watch this, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his message. He said, I've come, when, I, when, I, when, he, when he came that time and ministered there for about a year and a half, he says, I came and I preached Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We have a lot of folks today, they're seeking after the wisdom of men. I want to tell you, the wisdom of men is not what we need today. We've had enough of that. We need the power of God to fall upon our lives and upon our churches. He was fearful. What was Paul fearful? It says here that he, when he came to them, he was in trembling and, and in fear was it because he had been mistreated in the other places where he had been? Is it because when he was in Philippi, he had been in prison, he was kicked out of Thessalonica, he was kicked out of Berea, he goes to Athens, he's made fun of? Is it because of that? No, I think that the main reason why he was in fear was he was in fear of the gospel being rejected. He didn't want the gospel of Jesus Christ to be rejected. But then also over in chapter 9 and verse 27, it seems to indicate that he was a little bit fearful in his own adequacy. Have you ever just felt like you're just not adequate for the job? <laughs> All the time. Just don't feel like I'm adequate for the job. But what he would understand and what you and I need to understand is that when we are weak and understand our weakness, then he is strong. That he's powerful, and he is more than adequate in our lives. So Paul is now writing anywhere from two to three years after he has basically pastored there for a year and a half. He's gone into that church, he started the church, he ministered there for a year and a half, and now two, three years later, he's hearing all this stuff. What began to happen after he left all the trouble that they began to have. And of course, a lot of the reason why they had the trouble was because as soon as Paul left, false teachers began to come in. 
And you see, false teachers began to come in because they were not willing to face Paul face to face. They didn't want to have anything to do with him, so they talked behind his back. They would wait till he would leave in different places, and then they would come. And they began to teach their heresy in the churches. And Paul is going to, he's going to tell them in essence in this letter, get back to the basics. He's going to tell them to get back to the basics. Now you look at your outline, it's very short, and this message is even shorter. You're right. It's shorter in the outline. You've got a lot of room that you can put other stuff on there. And I'm only going to get to half of what you see there on that little outline. But I want you to notice the first thing he says, getting back to the basics, he says, focus on the cross. In getting back to the basics at Corinth, he said, you got to get back to the cross. In getting back to the basics for us, we need to get back to the cross. It is a wonderful thing to be able to sing about the blood of Jesus. Hello. I want you to wake up now. It's a wonderful thing to be able to sing about the blood of Jesus. We got churches today that are offended by the blood of Jesus. We got churches that will no longer sing about the blood of Jesus, that they will instruct their preachers, you don't preach on the blood of Jesus because that is offensive. Well, I'm going to tell you that's offensive to me. And you can bet one thing, you can bet one thing, if Sweetwater ever says don't uh, preach and sing about the blood of Jesus, I'm out of here. So will Brother Larry be out of here. We're going to sing the blood of Jesus. We're going to preach the blood of Jesus. I want you to notice Paul's approach. Paul had not gone to Corinth to establish a fan club. He's not going to Corinth to make everybody happy, obviously. He's not going to make very many happy with his letter. You're not going to like some of the things that we talk about in this letter as we study it. He had not gone there to make a fan club. He had gone there to glorify God. Oftentimes, in the stark contrast, we have philosophers and teachers that would rely upon their own eloquence in being able to speak than on the, the, on, than on the power of God, and they would rely on that to get followers. So that was in Corinth. Does that still happen today? People that rely upon their own eloquence to, get, to gain followers. Sure, we have that going on all the time today. I want us to understand that Corinth was filled with eloquent, powerful, persuasive teachers. Our country is filled with powerful, persuasive speakers who do not teach the truth. They are charlatans. They are phonies. That's why you have to be rooted in what the Word of God says. This name it, claim it stuff. That's not of God. Prosperity theology is not of God. It's not the truth. Let me ask you something. When folks say that when you follow Jesus, you will always be prosperous financially. Let me ask you about these folks that are believers today in the Ukraine. How does that work for them? That theology is faulty. I was talking to Brother Eric this morning. He said that he was able to watch the Mother Church there on Facebook this morning. And I watch them too, but I can't ever understand anything for some reason. But they're worshiping in Romania, and what happened today, they, they, uh, some of the Ukrainian refugees went to church there at the mother church, and they shared their Christian testimony. <laughs> they shared their testimony, how God had been working in their life. And Eric said, as, as I watched it, he said, I just wept the whole entire time. These people have been touched by the power of God. They, they, they're not prosperous financially. They don't have anything. He said many of them don't have, even have a passport. And so they've just been moving across that line and going to get some protection somewhere, and they don't have a passport. They have no idea what they're going to do. But they're trusting in Jesus. They know Jesus. Paul did not rely on eloquent speech. He did not rely on eloquent arguments or clever arguments. He simply said, I've come to you, declared the word of God, and I declared it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if Paul had gotten into saying, I'm going to use this spectacular speech, which he could have, 
If I'm going to get up there and I'm going to talk philosophy, I, he could have. He would have lifted himself up rather than lifting up Jesus. The church had a beautiful stained glass window behind the pulpit. And it showed Jesus on the cross. One Sunday, they had a guest preacher who was much smaller than the pastor that usually preached in that pulpit. The little girl turned to her mother while the guest preacher was there and asked, where is the man who usually stands there where we can't even see Jesus? Too many preachers magnify their gifts and fail to reveal the glory of Jesus. Folks, I'm going to tell you, we are to be all about revealing the glory of Jesus. When we preach, when you teach, when you live, everywhere you go, we're to be about glorifying Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said, the power that is in the gospel does not lie in the eloquence of the preacher. Otherwise, men would be the converters of the souls. Nor does it lie in a preacher's learning. Otherwise, it would consist in the wisdom of men. We might preach until our tongues have rotted, till we exhaust our lungs and die. But never a soul would be converted unless the Holy Spirit works with the Word of God to give the power to be able to convert the soul. Paul gloried only in the cross. He said, I, I, he said, when I came, I came preaching one message, the cross. That doesn't mean he didn't deal with other things, but he came, and that was the centrality of his ministry was the cross. Galatians 6.14 said, Paul says, but God forbid that I should boast, save in the death of Jesus Christ our Lord. God forbid that any of us should boast about ourselves. God forbid that we should ever boast about our church. God forbid that we should boast in anything save the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul gloried only in the cross. You see the views of the cross in that day? Here's some of the views. The Romans viewed the cross as a naked hideousness. That's why no Roman citizen could ever be crucified on a cross. The Greeks saw it as something totally philosophically irrational. The Jews saw the cross as a place of shame and a place of suffering. Paul had a different view of the cross. When Paul looked at the cross, he saw the love of God. When Paul looked at the cross, he saw the mercy of Jesus. He saw forgiveness. So why did Paul, why did Paul glory in the cross? I want to tell you one reason. It is the emblem of the Christian faith. It speaks a universal language. Paul was able to glory in the cross because he understood whether he was in Corinth, whether he was in Athens, wherever it was that he preached, that it preached a universal message. It had a universal language. It speaks to every nation. It speaks to every language. It speaks to every family. It speaks to every person. The cross speaks today, 2,000 years later, to believers right here in America. When you understand the, the, the magnitude of what Jesus did on the cross, it speaks to our hearts, or it should. It speaks to the heart when they preach today, wherever they are in Afghanistan, whether they're preaching from a cave, somewhere in the underground church there in China, or, or wherever they are in the Ukraine today, and they're preaching the message of the cross, it still speaks. In Romania, when we go in a few days, when we're going to be able to preach to the Ukrainians and preach to the Romanians, I want to tell you that it still works. The preaching of the cross still draws people to be saved, and we should glory only in the cross of Jesus. And by the way, 
It works not just in Romania and Ukraine and Afghanistan, but the preaching of the cross is still working in Russia today. There are lots of believers in Russia today, and we need to be reminded of that. They don't like what's going on. We need to pray for them too. Why can we glory in the cross? It is the cruelest mode of execution that's ever been devised. Yet, our Savior died there for us. It, it, the Bible says, cursed is every man who hung upon a tree. Listen to me, friend. He bore the curse for us. <laughs> The pure, undefiled Son of God literally became sin for us when He died there. I think I got to get it more personal. He, he was literally humiliated for me. Jesus was beaten before He went to the cross for me. He was beaten beyond the point of recognition for me. They blindfolded him so that before they punched or when they punched him, he would not be able to recall from the punch because he would not know where the punch was coming from. He took that beating. He took that beating for me. He took that crown of thorns. When they rammed that crown of thorns down into his brow, he took that crown of thorns on for me. I should be glorying in the cross. He was scourged with a cat of nine tails for me. He was beaten to the point of death before crucifixion for me. His back was shredded down to the bone for me. He was nailed to a cross with seven to nine inch spikes in his hands and his feet for me. He was crucified between two criminals for me. He became sin for me. Why? Why brag on the cross? Why brag on the cross? Because I want to tell you, there is no pardon without the cross. There is no peace without the cross. There is no forgiveness without the cross. There is no reconciliation with God without the cross. The cross provides eternal life to all those who trust in Christ. We must preach the cross. And I want you to notice one more thing. I want you to notice Paul's attitude. Notice Paul's attitude. Paul came to them as a humble servant. Paul knew that when he was weak, God made him strong. And listen, as he came to them, he depended on the Holy Spirit. His power and what he did did not come from all his experience. And he had a lot of it. It did not come from his experience. For see, Paul, when he preached, did not preach to perform. He didn't preach to perform. His preaching was a demonstration, he said. That's what he said. What's that word demonstration mean? The word demonstration carries with it the idea of legal proof. Brother Gary, legal proof. He was demonstrating legally, like he was presenting in court, the significance of the crucifixion. Lives were changed. That was the proof that the message was from God because lives were changed. Now, what's he not saying? Paul is not saying, do not use your gifts in preaching and teaching. 
Spurgeon had great gifts, didn't he? Man, I'm just, you know, learning more and more about Charles Spurgeon. He had great gifts, great oratory ability, powerful voice. Doesn't mean don't use it. George Whitfield, tremendously gifted preacher. Dwight L. Moody, Billy Sunday, great athlete, used his gifts even as he was preaching. Again, we're told Billy Sunday would get so excited when he was preaching that he would turn cartwheels. Literally, I'm told, you know, you read about him, he, he would jump off the stage sometime. Go ahead and go to sleep in here, okay? <laughs> go ahead, you're going to miss something. <laughs> Billy Graham, gifted preacher. I think of a Bob Pittman, gifted preacher. But here's the significance about these guys. As they used their abilities, they did not rely upon their natural talents. They trusted in the Holy Spirit to work through them. Several years ago, back sometime in the point of Dr. Billy Graham's ministry, a reporter decided that they were, they were going to, they asked for an interview with, the, uh, with Dr. Graham. And, and so she was, they were invited to go to his hotel. And, and when they got there, it was sometime in the day prior to the crusade, when they got there to go to knock on the door, the door was kind of cracked open. They eased open the door. And what they saw was Billy Graham lying on his face on the floor, laying prostrate before God. This great man of God, incredible ability to hold you in, in his hand when he preached, was laying out before the Lord, begging God to fill him with his spirit and use him as he preached that night. This person was going to ask, what's the secret of your success? And then they figured out, this is the reason why. This is the reason why. Paul's goal, what was that? Paul's goal, he wanted them to trust in God, not to trust in the messenger. They had a problem with that in Corinth. They tried to trust in Peter. They trust in Apollos. They trust in Paul. They trust in the leaders. And he said, don't trust in the leader. Trust in God. Well, think about what Jesus did on the cross and the emphasis on the crucifixion. I'm reminded of the temple. The temple was a series of obstructions. If you were a Gentile, you could go to the court of the Gentiles, but then there was a wall. You couldn't go no further. If you were a woman, you could go to the court of the women, but there was a wall. You couldn't go no further. If you were the high priest, you could go into the Holy of Holies, but only the high priest could go, and only the high priest could go once a year on the Day of Atonement. What does this remind me of? This reminds me of sin. It reminds me that sin keeps us from God. Obstacles, walls that keep us from God. When Jesus died on the cross, he died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He died at the exact same time time that the Passover lamb was being offered for the sin of the nation. The high priest was in the Holy of Holies. Can you imagine the high priest when the veil was torn asunder, when Jesus died? The Bible said 
that he said, it is finished. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, died exactly the same time as that Passover lamb. Jesus was in charge all the way. He wasn't going to die a split second before he was supposed to. Now, because of that, there's no more lambs needed to be sacrificed. God opened up the door of grace. He was the Passover lamb. Once and for all, God opened up the door of grace. So you know what that means for me? I can call him father. He is my father. You've probably heard the story before. A little girl in London, lost, couldn't find her way home. Police officer kind of sees her wandering around and says, Hun, where do you live? We'll take you home. Don't worry. We're going to get you home. She says, if you can just take me to the little church that has the cross on it, I can get home from there. I can get home from there. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall never get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. We go home. We get to heaven through what Jesus did on the cross. No wonder Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. Father, I thank you that we could be reminded today of what we must do to keep the cross of Jesus center in our lives, in our church, in our preaching, our teaching, in our living. I thank you, Father, for the power of the cross. I thank you for it was the power of the cross and what you did on the cross that made it possible for me to be saved. suffering for me. Thank you for paying the price for me. Oh, how I praise you for that old rugged cross. I pray today, Father, for those that are here that have never met you, never been saved. commitments to be made in this place in this house as a result of what you've done for us forgive us Lord for neglecting you for 
Forgive us for being ashamed. Forgive us for denying you. Father, I pray for those that, the other commitments that need to be made today. Whatever needs to be made, Lord, I pray that we would be totally obedient to you as you were going to the cross for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You respond as the Lord leads you. The altar's for you to come right now. Some of you need to bust it down to this altar and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Let's, let's sing, Brother Larry.